2018, first day of the new year. So I've been thinking about what we could, you know, a good refresh our memory maybe about Jesus coming and being born just like we've recently celebrated the birth of Jesus Christ. So going forward, how we can think about what Jesus has done for our salvation. And I think that would be good and simple for us to understand about what Jesus has already done for us <clears throat> as it relates to the Old Testament and the New Testament. Under the Old Covenant and under the New Covenant. So first, I want to look at Matthew chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4 really quickly, real simply and quickly. In Matthew chapter 1, look at this picture. This is Mary as a young woman, and the angel Gabriel has come to let her know that she would have a son. And Mary said, but how will this happen? I have not slept with a man, and I'm a virgin. And he told her that the Holy Spirit would come over you, and she would deliver a baby. And that would be from God in heaven. Okay? In Matthew chapter 2, about Jesus' birth. And then King Herod wanted to kill Jesus because he didn't want Jesus to become king. And so he killed all the young sons under two, two and younger. And God let Joseph know through a dream to take his wife and the baby and escape to Egypt. And we'll discuss about this. In Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus came and John the Baptist said, There is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus was baptized in the water. Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Says. I'm going to sign this real quickly. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So God the Father said, this is my son. And we're going to discuss about this later too. So, now Jesus was baptized. And after that, Jesus was on a mission. You know, God sent him to come. It's interesting that this is, this verse 17, Matthew chapter 3, Verse 17 is the last verse in chapter 3. And then it begins with Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. And it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, into the desert, to be tempted by the devil. Like, what? Jesus was just baptized. And God said, This is my son. I am well pleased with him. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit was leading Jesus out into the well wilderness. What? To be tempted by the devil? What is that all about? Well, this, if you look at the Old Testament, we understand. Jesus was there and he was tempted by the devil. And he went through that time for us. We'll notice that later. All the things that Jesus did was for us. It was for our salvation. So let's look at 
this. Jesus was so tired. He was hungry. You know, he'd been in the desert for a very long time, for 40 days. 40 days, no food. And it was rough. Look at this verse. In Luke chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan. The Jordan River. That's where Jesus was baptized and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. 40 days. He ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them he was hungry. Hmm. Is that important? You know, he was he was baptized and then he went into the, the wilderness. Why? be tempted by the devil? What? The Holy Spirit led him there? That was God's plan for Jesus to go into the desert for 40 days. But what's this about? If you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, we have a comparison. Adam, first man, and Jesus was called what? The second Adam. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, I know you all, I've been preaching and teaching about 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and what is it about? Does anybody remember? Megan's like, oh, look at her facial expression. She's trying to think. It's about the resurrection. Jesus' is resurrection, remember? Jesus was resurrected. And that we learn about that in chapter, um, excuse me, chapter... Yes, 15 of 1 Corinthians. And the first man was Adam. And he became a living being. You remember God created Adam out of the dust of the earth. And he breathed life into Adam. And he became a living being. The last Adam, it says here, a life-giving spirit means he himself is a life-giving spirit. Whoever believes in Jesus, he gives life. He is the second Adam. In verse 47, the next verse, it says, the first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven second man came from heaven. That's important. That's why it's emphasized. He came from heaven. The first man, Adam, he was from the dust of the earth. Just like all of us. You know, we were born from the dust of the earth. And Jesus, when he came from heaven, we need him from there. Not from earth, but from <coughs> heaven. Okay? Verse 22 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says, For as in Adam all die. That means our physical body will die. We will die. All will die. Why? Because we're in Adam. We were descended from Adam. And we will die. All of us. So, says so it's like a comparison all these die from Adam and the comparison is in Christ it's important that those of us who are in Christ have all been made alive and that means we're from our death our bodies will die but we will receive new glorified bodies and we will be alive forever we will have eternal life how? Because of Jesus Christ. Not from what we have done, but from what Jesus has done. You 
understand? It's important to emphasize that. Jesus did it all. I want to emphasize, in Christ, this comparison is in Christ. Now, all of you look at this and see this comparison. Look at this. This is very interesting. I have a few more details I want to show you. Comparisons from Adam comparing to the second Adam. The first Adam. So we're going to discuss this comparison. And then we're also going to discuss <coughs> Israel. God's people followed Moses and Abraham's children. And the true Israel was who? Who was the true, true Israel? Jesus. It's important. And we'll notice this color green. Later, I'll give you verses so that you can recognize the connection to, to this <coughs> comparison. And the verses that are yellow represent. All right, everybody good on this? So let's go back to Jesus' temptation in the desert, in the wilderness. Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 says, The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. The devil was tempting Jesus. Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The word is what God has spoken. There's a scripture. We, de we depend on that. Not only the bread, but the devil tempted him with bread and food. But Jesus did not allow himself to fall into temptation. Okay? Let's look at this second. The devil also said, took him up to a high mountain and showed him everything, the kingdom of the earth. And he said, I'll give you this if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, it is written, we worship God, only God, and only him will I serve. Next, the devil took Jesus on top of the, some verses say on top of the temple, and some verses say on top of the mountain. So it doesn't matter. The point is, he took him on top of a pinnacle. And the devil tempted him and said, go ahead, jump. The angels will catch you and protect you from hitting the stones. And Jesus replied, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Test the Lord your God. Jesus resisted the temptation of the devil. Let me back up just a minute. When the devil came and tempted Jesus, what does it remind you of? Old Testament, <coughs> the devil tempted Adam and Eve. Remember? He tempted Adam. Now, before God told Adam in Genesis 2, verses 15 and 7 through 17, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of, knowledge, of the knowledge of good and evil. There was a certain tree that they were not supposed to eat from. For when you eat it, you will certainly die. So he told him to take care of everything in the land, 
the garden, but he told him, do not eat from that one tree. You can eat anything else. That was a simple, easy, right? Easy. Simple command to follow God's command. Comparing to Jesus facing the devil's temptations. That was hard. He was hungry. He wanted to eat. He was very hungry. Imagine if you had not eaten for 40 days. How hard you were, how terribly hungry you would be. You might see a rat and, and would eat it. You might skin it and just eat it. You'd be so hungry you would eat anything. Maybe a spoiled hamburger. You would eat it anyway. Why? Because you would be so hungry. But Jesus still resisted that temptation. This temptation was nothing. He put Adam in the, in the garden. And he told him, don't eat from this one tree. But he failed. Right? He failed. Yeah, he failed big time, Robert said. Yes, it was a simple command. Adam and Eve, when Eve was thinking about, oh, if I eat it, then we will know something and, and we will be like God. And so Adam stood there and let Eve fall into temptation and he followed her, you know. It was a simple command. But compared to Jesus, the temptations that Jesus faced, God put Adam to work the land just like King David. He, he told him he would have reign over the earth, over the new earth, a new heaven. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 1, God told Israel, continue to be faithful, take care of the land, the promised land, right before they were going into the promised land. First, the Garden of Eden, and they failed. And then God told the people of Israel, take care of the land when you get into the promised land said be careful to follow every command I am giving you today you know just like God told Adam don't eat from that tree and God was telling Israel people to be careful follow every command that I'm giving you so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors Abraham, son, Isaac, and Jacob. God promised this to them, that they would have descendants. We're going to talk about that later also. But this is interesting. The land, Adam had to take care of the garden, and then second, he told the Israelites to take care of the land, but then, the third, Jesus Christ. Adam failed. Israel, what did they do? <coughs> In Deuteronomy verse 2, it says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart whether or not you would keep his commands. The people of Israel, they needed to obey his commands. Did they? Were they successful in obeying the law? No, they failed also, just like Adam. Adam failed. The people of Israel failed. And today there are people that emphasize, you know, you have to obey the law, just like Jewish people who believe Salvation is through Jesus Christ, but they also say you have to obey the law too. No, we will all fail. Even if we try, we will fail. Trying to obey all those laws will fail, period. You have to obey A to Z from the time you are born until the time you grow up. No, we will fail. Just like Israel failed and Adam failed. But notice this, it says... The Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. Remember the people of Israel had followed Moses for 40 years wandering. Just like Jesus Christ 
was led by the Spirit into the wilderness 40 days. And he was tempted by the devil. 40 days, 40 years. See the comparison? Israel are considered as Adam also. As the second Adam. And then Jesus Christ, no, wait, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. They are compared to the first Adam, and then Jesus Christ is the second Adam, the last Adam. Forty days, Israel, forty years. See that comparison? Israel failed, of course. Adam failed, Israel failed, but Jesus Christ was successful. He overcame the devil's temptation. Okay? Let's look at this. There's more. Remember, right before the people of Israel followed Moses into the wilderness for 40 years, right before that, what happened right before that? You know, the Red Sea parted, and the people of Israel went through on dry land. Remember the soldiers from Egypt and Pharaoh? Now, uh, spell this. Pharaoh. Know, followed the people of Israel but they were covered by the water and they were killed but the people of Egypt the, the Israelites went through go this is like baptism a comparison of baptism the Red Sea parted and Jesus when he was baptized in the Jordan River passed through. He passed through the water of the Jordan River. That was a comparison in Matthew chapter 3. So now we talk about the first Adam and the second Adam and Israel and the true Israel. Right before the people of Israel, they were slaves in Egypt at that time, in Egypt. And right before they left Egypt and escaped to the Red Sea and it parted, right before that, Moses told Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel, these people of Israel, Israelites is my firstborn son. It's interesting. My firstborn son. Hmm. What's the point of that? It points to Jesus Christ. He was the firstborn son. In Hosea 11 verse 1 it says when Israel was a child I, many God, loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The people during that time, they understood that to be the Israelites. They were his son because they had left Egypt. They were slaves there. But really, this verse has a double meaning. Yes, it was from the people about the people of Israel. His son, he loved them, he called them out of Egypt, yes. But, at that time, remember I showed you that picture of Joseph and Mary escaping from the king Herod to go to Egypt? And they stayed there until the king Herod died. And then the angel let Joseph know that he could come back out of Egypt. So in Matthew chapter 2, verse 14, it says, So when he got up, Joseph, he took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until Herod died. And so what was fulfilled, and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. He was the prophet. 
It says, out of Egypt I called my son. Through the prophet, that's the prophet Hosea, out of Egypt I called my son. So who is his son? Jesus. Jesus came out of Egypt. That was fulfilled, the prophecy of Hosea. Israel, yes, but Jesus himself was the true Israel. The true Israel was successful. The Israelites they were supposed to be responsible to let people know about God, to worship God, share the Ten Commandments to the people of other nations. That's what they should have done, but they failed. They should have been a light to the nations, but they failed. Jesus was a light to all the people of all nations, and he was successful. He is the true Israel. Very interesting. And that's why Israel has an example like you know like a logo like a hymn Israel has the vine like an olive tree and the vine look at this verse John chapter 15 verse 1 it says I am the true vine and Israel was a vine also but they failed Says, I am the true vine, Jesus Christ. He was successful, and he is the true Israel. And my father is the gardener. He is the one that takes care of everything. And we who trust in Jesus Christ and have salvation, we are the branches, and we are in Jesus Christ, who is the true vine. Amen. Jesus was successful as the true Israel. Okay? So how can we, how can we be connected to Jesus as the true Israel? How can we do that? <coughs> By being in Christ, Megan says. Well, I'll expound on that. Let me ask you this. When a person that is in Christ they need to obey the law this 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 no israel failed israel failed so let me ask you is it necessary to go to church to be faithful you know is that helps you be successful in christ no do we have to be water baptized no believe and trust in jesus christ faith in jesus christ alone and what is the specific that person does a person does to trust in Jesus Christ? Let's look at this verse. In Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, Paul wrote warning the Jewish people who thought, you know, because they were descended from Abraham by blood, the Jewish people, that we were God's chosen people. And, and that's true. But, again, Israel failed. They have to depend on Jesus Christ. Obeying all those laws, what they do, obeying the commands, they failed. Adam failed. The people long ago of Israel failed. And we, can we fail the law? Can we follow the law? No, we can't obey the law. We fail. The plan of salvation. Some people believe this. You hear the gospel, and then you have to believe, and then you have to be water baptized, and then you have to speak in tongues, and then you have to get the gift of the Holy Spirit. No. Only through faith. Remember, what truly happens in salvation is inward. It is not from outward. And what you do on the outside, it's inward. Water baptism is an outside sign. Going to church is an outside sign. What you do as we love the Lord, serving Him, that's an outside sign. All of those things are a fruit. That's the result of our faith. 
that's inside of us. And that's what changes us inside. This verse says, A person is not a Jew who is one only outward. Talking about the Jewish people. You know, outwardly, yes. By blood, they were born from Abraham, yes. But not only that. Nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. Just like water baptism, it's an outward sign. It's physical. It's, it's an example. Just like circumcision was an example. The Old Testament, the New Testament, some people believe, you know, in sprinkling and full submersion. That's an example. That's a, an example. What counts on the outside for our salvation? No. A person is a Jew who is one inwardly salvation is inside that's what he's talking about and circumcision is circumcision of the heart how does that happen to have a circumcised heart how do we become enthusiastic and passionate to serve we want to be baptized. We want to spread the gospel. How does that happen? By the Holy Spirit. <coughs> By the Spirit. We are born again from the Spirit. Just like it says in John chapter 3, verse 5, I think. We are born from the Spirit and water. I'm not talking about water baptism. Baptism of water means is the gospel. The water means water washing regeneration the Holy Spirit washes us and cleanses us of our sins in the Old Testament water sprinkling was a sam example of the Holy Spirit's work not a physical baptism does the work no, nothing outwardly does that it's inwardly his work We have to look at the Old Testament here in Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 26 through 28. It says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone. You know, because our hearts are hard from sin. And give you a heart of flesh, tender heart. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. That means his laws. God established his laws. You know, laws don't change. His laws don't change. And be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. Land. Remember Adam? He gave the Garden of Eden to Adam and then the people of Israel. They were supposed to take care, and the goal was to obey and go into the promised land, and he would give them the land. And it points to the new heaven and the new earth. When Jesus is our king, and he will reign. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people, and I will be your God. But they rebelled. You know, we're sinful. We're lost. But he chose to circumcise our hearts and put in us a new spirit and a new heart and remove the heart of stone. He did that. That was Jesus' work. Is that clear? So, if you trust Jesus Christ for salvation, you already belong to Abraham. You are Abraham's seed. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And heirs... That means we will receive an inheritance. Not by our actions, not by our work. No, nothing. None of our work. Obeying the law or obeying rules or being baptized or I have to do church, perfect church attendance or, you know, confess to a priest. All of those, none of that. It all points to Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And heirs... <coughs> 
we will receive an inheritance. We didn't work for that. Who worked for that? God receives us. Jesus. He did all the work. So important to emphasize that. According to the promise. You know, not according to the law of or blood. In Genesis chapter 12, I think that's right, Genesis chapter 12, God promised Abraham that he would have descendants all over the world. And that's us, Gentiles, those of us who have been circumcised in our hearts. Nothing outside but inside. That's exactly what happens inside before you came to church, before you were involved in Bible study, you ain't sweating, sorry. Before all of that, you were involved. Wow. It's clear that Jesus has done all the work. Through him we're saved. Not through things that we do. No. Things that we do, that is our fruit. That's the result of our faith. Okay? Galatians chapter 6, verse 15 and 16, it says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, it doesn't matter, means anything. The Jewish who were circumcised and the Gentiles who were not, saying the Jews are better, no, it means nothing. It means nothing. Just like I say, I've been baptized, it doesn't mean that person is saved. The point is, you're saved through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what counts. It's inside. That's what counts. All these other things, they don't count. What counts is the new creation. Inside we, in Christ, we are a new creation. We become new creatures. So salvation has nothing to do with all of these things that we have done. Nothing. Nothing. Believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. He has taken care of everything. Jesus has done it all. We, who are new creatures in Christ, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, We who are free are in Christ are new creatures. The old things have gone and the new things have come. It's a glimpse of the future, of the new earth and the new heaven. Everything will be new. We will live there in eternity, the land there. This land is groaning. It's looking forward to Jesus Christ coming and saving this creation. We are new creatures in Christ, and it starts on the inside. The verse continues and says, Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. This is from the Greek word, it's a set, to all. You know, this is how ASL signs it. Now, we tend to sign it like that. To all. Who follow this rule to the Israel of God. Who is that? That's us. Us. We. We are spiritual Israel. And how did that happen? When the Holy Spirit came in and changed our hearts from God. Hoping we are focusing on God's word. Are you excited? Now look at this. Notice what it says. To all who follow this rule. Hmm. What does that mean? Obeying rules? No, no. What this means is, like today, let me apply this to today. Maybe some of you know, you know, a building and, and they measure and they have that string that they use to, uh, it's colored purple, you know, a chalk line. Um, line. Chalk line. Or chalk line. Plum line. Plum line, yeah, that. And they let go, and it, and it makes a chalk line. It's just like a carpenter on a piece of wood. He 
you know, we have to follow that line. That's what this means. Follow what Paul was writing. He was talking about Jesus' action, the Holy Spirit, justification through faith in him. We follow that route. We follow that way. We follow that truth. That's what he's talking about, to follow this rule. It's not really a rule. It's a line, a guideline. It's not talking about following rules, following the obeying the law, obeying, obeying, obeying. No, it's talking about following a certain path of truth. Okay, you got that? So we who have trusted in Jesus Christ, we have salvation. We are spiritual Israel. How? Through the Holy Spirit. He has circumcised our heart. He has removed the heart of stone and given us a new spirit and a new heart, a heart of flesh, a soft heart. And from there on out, we obey his commands. How? By the Holy Spirit has circumcised our hearts. Not through circumcision of outward ways physically, not through water baptism, not through our actions. Again, that is the fruit, that is evidence of our faith, in inward faith, okay? So, we are Israel of God. Yes, we are identified with Jesus Christ how we can show that we are identified is by water baptism. That is an identification. But that does not save us. Is it related to salvation? Only through Jesus Christ and what he has done. Remember, I just explained all of these things, these comparisons, and all these things that are the same. Wow. Okay, praise God for that. If you all believe and you say, yes, I am spiritual Israel. We follow this truth, this path of truth. Live it. Are you living it? Are you truly practicing what you've been taught and what you've learned in your heart? Is your Are your outward actions, do you want to obey? Do you want to live a holy life? You should. You should. If you are truly spiritual Israel, how do you know? Look at your heart. Are you passionate to obey Him? Are you passionate to be involved in serving the Lord and being involved in church and these other things? That shows that you have faith. James said, he warned us, and he said, if you have faith without actions, your faith is dead. What that means is, you know, we're not really dead. We say our heart is new, the spirit is new, and there's no enthusiasm, enthusiasm to serve the Lord, then that means that you have no faith. Are you following this rule? I want you to think about that. Am I truly saved? Am I passionate, enthusiastic to serve people? Your heart has been changed. Amen? Let me pray. Father, we're so grateful, Lord, for these scriptures that clearly show the old things of Adam and Israel they failed but Jesus was successful they failed many religious people emphasize outward actions but we will fail we will fail it's only Jesus Christ and what he has done that is that is successful he accomplished his mission we thank you Lord for loving us and sending Jesus to die on the cross for us and his resurrection proved the truth in jesus name amen